So in our last part, uh, monopolistic competition and oligopoly, uh, we're going to talk about cartels, uh, specifically an example of two different cartels and why one cartel is successful and the other one is not. So producers in cartel explicitly agree to cooperate in setting prices and output level. So that's the objective that either they decide based on their uh, uh, price uh, or, a, uh, or they can uh, decide about the quantity. If enough producers adhere to the cartel agreement and if the market demand is sufficiently inelastic, the cartel may drive prices well above competitive level. Cartels are often international, while the U.S. antitrust laws prohibit American companies from colluding. Uh, those of other countries are much weaker and are sometimes poorly enforced. Furthermore, uh, nothing prevents countries or companies owned or controlled by foreign governments from farming cartels. And the, the good example uh, from the world is the OPEC cartel is an international agreement among oil producing countries which has succeeded in raising world oil prices above competitive level. Now, what are the conditions for a cartel successful? Uh, the first, a stable cartel organization must be formed whose members agree on price and the production level that then uh, adhere to that agreement. And the second condition, uh, and maybe the most important, is the potential for monopoly power. Even if the cartel can solve its organizational problem, there will be a little room to raise prices if they are facing an elastic demand curve. Uh, analysis of a cartel, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about two different uh, world cartels. One is OPEC, oil producing and exporting countries, and uh, the other one is uh, CI, countries of uh, <coughs> producing and exporting copper. That's what we call it as a cartel for copper. So this will be uh, help us understand why OPEC was successful in raising prices while CIPEC was not. Now, if you look at the world demand for oil, or uh, this is our total demand, TD, and we can see that uh, uh, the, uh, this purple uh, line is an OPEC country's demand curve or a demand curve for OPEC country's oil. Uh, and this one is the total one. And this... Mm. Uh, line is a uh, marginal revenue for OPEC countries and you can see that they are deciding this much quantity which is OPEC quantity OPEC quantity uh, so, I okay. so they decided this much because of the marginal cost and the minor revenue of OPEC countries so this much is produced by OPEC countries and this one is, uh, uh, you see uh, here, uh, that's the price they're going to set it. Uh, it's a competitive price, but they are not setting this competitive price. They are deciding based on this is the price. So TD is the total demand uh, curve for oil and uh, SC is the competitive non opaque supply curve, right? Uh, so uh, because both total demand and a competitive supply are inelastic, so OPEC demand is inelastic and OPEC's profit maximizing quantity, Q OPEC, is found at the intersection of its marginal revenue and marginal cost curve. At this quantity, OPEC charges a price P star. If OPEC producers had not cartelized, price would be PC, where OPEC's demand and marginal cost curve intersect. So that's a on the other hand, if we look at the uh, the demand curve for the copper, the TD is the total demand for copper, and SC is the competitive dot uh, CIPC supply curve. So we can see that CP the quantity is CPC is this <coughs> based on the minor revenue and minor cost, and this is the total. Uh, CIP uh, CIPEC's demand curve uh, is a difference between the two, both total demand and a competitive supply are relatively elastic. You see these are the curves are flatter curves. So CIPEC's demand is elastic and CIPEC has a very little monopoly power. And because of this, uh, the price P star is a very slightly higher than the competitive price. But here you can see that the price is quite high as compared to a competitive price. So as the examples of OPEC and CIPEC illustrate, successful cartelization requires two things. First, the total demand for the 
goods must not be very price elastic so elastic inelastic demand like oil has a inelastic demand second either the cartel must control nearly all the world supply or if does not the supply of non cartel producers must not be price elastic so most international commodity cartels have failed because few world markets meet both conditions here we also see uh, in our practical example of uh, this uh, uh, college uh, uh, intercollegiate athletics intercollegiate athletics provides entertainment and promotes school spirit but it is also a big and extremely profitable industry uh, this profitability is the result of a monopoly power obtained via cartelization the cartel organization is the national college athletic association ncaa at issue is where whether the ncaa is a good cartel in the sense of creating benefit for both the student athletes and the fans who watch the games or is the ncaa or net harmful and if so should be should it be restricted in the constraints it imposes on college sports here are authors disagree it is true that when it comes to football and a basketball the ncaa has been a source of a considerable profit for the largest division 1 schools say uh, ruben field but a substantial portion of those profits are used to subsidize women's athletes and other men's sports and some sports uh other college and universities activities i agree that the fans greatly value college sports counter uh, uh pandemic uh, and i can see you call it a good cartel since you are an avid basketball fan but it's still a cartel and it has used its cartel power to generate huge profits so cartel is cartel uh, my biggest beef with the uh, uh, ncaa is its restraint Uh, restraint not to pay the so called student athletes says pandic i agree replies rubens field that this state uh, this restraint is central to the ncaa but the question is whether the benefit from this uh, restraint exceeds the possible harm the question is being argued in the court which for now have decided that the restraint is legal perhaps we we will have a supreme court decision that finally resolves our dispute if we we will write about it in the 10th edition of this book uh the auto parts cartel uh, in september 2011 the us department of justice uh, announced its settlement of its investigation into an international auto parts cartel that has engaged in bid rigging uh, and price fixing across a wide range of auto parts industries including manufacturing of steering wheel uh, steering wheel and seat belts and white uh, winch uh, shield wipers the investigation uh into the auto part cartel in the us have led to criminal indictment in of more than 58 individuals and 38 companies and have generated more than 2.6 billion in fines what is clear that is that the successful operation of a cartel or cartels was aided by a regular communication in person meeting and telephone calls in which agreements were reached not only with respect to price but also on a ways of monitoring the actions of the cartel members and finding ways to punish members that did not support the agreements the extent to which the auto parts cartel has adversely affected car buyers is unclear and will require substantial economic analysis of a part maker so these are the two practical uh, uh, in uh, cases or ideas of a cartel making in us where the cartel making is not legal uh, however uh, the world cartels and in which we discuss the opec and C- cipec uh, that uh, is uh, uh, the legal it's not uh, in a way that we can force the law of us on these independent countries because uh, in opec and cipec uh, the countries are involved So this is all what we want to discuss about the uh, market for uh, monopolistically competitive market as well as uh, oligopoly. So in the coming chapters we uh, in the chapter the last chapter of this uh, course uh, we will discuss in detail about the game theory. So thank you very much. So see you in uh, next video. Bye bye.